Right. Hey guys. Hey. Uh, welcome to uh, Unit Executive Branch. Sorry, just in the camera there. Uh, Executive Branch Lecture Five. The last lecture. This is uh, notes twelve through fifteen. All right. So now we study the Imperial Presidency. And so what you have to think is Imperial is just like it sounds like, like an emperor. All right. So there was a political scientist in the seventies named Arthur Schlesinger. All right. And Arthur Schlesinger wrote an essay that basically said and did research, and he said he had evidence that the presidency, right, had grown too powerful, um, say, post-World War II from, say, FDR on. They, remember, that at the beginning of this country, the Congress tended to dominate. We had moments of presidential power. But La, Schlesinger's argument is from the 40s, you know, to, to the 70s, he had witnessed an imperial growth uh, an imperial-like or an emperor-like president, and therefore the balance of power between Congress and the president had shifted towards the presidency, all right? Now, um, there's also a political scientist named Theodore Lowy who said, you know, uh, society demanded a stronger executive to act more quickly than Congress has the ability to do. Um, also, the fact that uh, Congress, you know, because of the two presidencies theses, right, with Vidalski, this idea that Congress tended to give presidents lots of power in foreign policies, so it wasn't that they were sneaking it or taking it away, as Congress had given it to them, all right? So, now you've got to look at this. Arthur Schlesinger said there's some areas in which presidents have become imperial, or in, in, in this case, abuse. So, presidents have abused their war powers. Presidents have abused their emergency powers. Presidents have abused the use of executive agreements. They've abused the, the privilege of executive privilege and uh, impoundment. All right, so those are the five things that, that Schlesinger argues have given presidents imperial uh, a power, all right? And so war powers. You guys already know this conflict. Congress declares war, but the president's commander-in-chief and conducts this war, all right? And so generally, presidents earlier in the 18th century, 19th century, were given permission to go to war by presidents because there was a little bit more time to deliberate. However, um, you know, the world is much quicker, and presidents have inserted troops all over the world without formal congressional declarations of war. Now, sometimes they've gone back and asked for a resolution, which is basically, hey, can we send these troops in? The Iraq War, uh, uh, the first Gulf War, um, you know, Congress has given approval for those, but not necessarily declared war, all right? Um, and so, like, the notes talk about 125 times presidents have sent troops into a country for war, basically, without a declaration of war. And how does that work? All right? Um, you know, the, the current Iraq war, Afghanistan, you know, those are wars that don't have congressional declarations of war. All right? Um, now, Congress has generally gone along with them. They've funded them. One of the reasons they're going to go along, if the president inserts troops, you know, they're not going to defund our troops in country while they're fighting a war. You know, they can't do that. They won't do that. All right. Um, now, um, and another reason is sometimes though um, we need warlike action that may be shorter, or we need warlike action that demands quick speed to defend us. But Congress is reluctant to give a declaration of war, and therefore Congress has kind of gone along with them. All right. Now. Uh, let's go over to emergency powers, right? Emergency powers. In times of emergency, as we know, presidents assume great powers. Because, again, that idea, that need to act quickly rather than time for debate with Congress. So, um, and we have a whole bunch of examples. Lincoln suspending habeas corpus, the censorship of the mail, control manufacturing. With Harry Truman tried to do that, right? Um, control of communication and transportation. Martial law. Like, uh, uh, I think... You're going to see, like if you want to see an example of martial law, in, in the Ukraine right now, um, protesters are demanding that their president step down. And he's asking the, the parliament to declare a state of martial law, which means you're going to see troops in the streets with curfews, you know, military soldiers telling people what to do to instill order. All right? Um, now, when does that happen? That's happening you know, after riots in the 60s and 70s. All right? Now, the Patriot Act, right? The Patriot Act. Passed by Congress, this is the funny thing, passed by Congress, but gives the power of the president tremendous power to try to find the bad guys uh, regarding terrorism. All right? And then even recently, as we're going to talk about in class today, right, then the NSA going through people's phone records, right? You know, those are, you know, it's an emergency because we're trying to stop terror from happening and therefore tremendous powers. All right? Now remember what an executive agreement is, right? An executive agreement, the third, um, Instead of a treaty, it acts like a treaty, but what it doesn't need is the Senate's approval, right? And presidents have used these uh, numerous times. I mean, they, they clearly outnumber the number of treaties signed um, 
recently, all right? Presidents use executive agreements to get things done quickly, and they can bypass Congress, all right? Um, now, this idea of executive privilege, all right? The definition is the president's right to not give up or divulge private or com uh, confidential conversations between himself and his advisors, people in the White House staff, people in the Council of Economic Advisors, or, or people in the executive office of the president, maybe even cabinet secretaries, all right? And the argument has been that if they didn't have the ability to have private conversations with those people, um, they wouldn't get honest information from them because people would always be worried that they're going to be, uh, you know, quoted in the newspaper, quoted in the media, and then that at times, if you're giving frank and honest advice, you could be made to look, you know, uh, negative or uh, in some way, and therefore, presidents have claimed executive privilege. All right. Now, generally, a president will also do that. Uh, for national security reasons. They'll say, we don't want this information to get out and therefore claim executive privilege, right? Um, so what we had is Richard Nixon, though. Richard Nixon was breaking the law, and he was claiming executive privilege to cover up him breaking that law. And so in the Supreme Court case of U.S. v. Nixon, what the Supreme Court said was, is a president indeed has um, executive privilege most of the time, but not in criminal cases, meaning if they believe that a president is conducting criminal um, activities, they can stop that executive privilege, all right? Um, and then finally, impoundment. And here's what impoundment is. Congress appropriates fund, funds for something, and a president refuses to spend them. That's impoundment, all right? Now, generally, what impoundment was used for was when, say, Congress appropriated money for uh, war, and then the war ended. A president would impound that money, meaning put it away so it's not going to be spent, right? Now, um, What's happened recently, or what had happened with impoundment was, especially with Nixon again, right, is that a president was getting a law passed by Congress, and fund, the, the funding was coming with it, and because the president didn't like that policy objective or what that law was doing, they just simply impounded the money and didn't spend the money, so the law didn't get carried out. You know, infuriating Congress, all right? So those are Schlesinger's five arguments for why a president has become too powerful. All right. Now, if you look at 14 and 15, it's kind of the response. How does Congress respond? Right? What do they do? You know, if they think in the 70s presidents have become imperial, what's the response from Congress to try to limit the president's powers or at least rein those powers in? Right? All right. And, and Congress is trying to reassert themselves. And again, you guys got to think of this: is like at the beginning of this country, where was power? How did it fluctuate? Where is it at from the 40s to the 70s? And then look now, we see Congress responding, all right? And the, the interesting thing is Congress may respond here, which we're going to talk about. Um, but presidents still, you know, the speed in which the modern world works, you know, there is a demand for quick action. And therefore, maybe that means presidents will always have tremendous power in certain areas and that Congress will just check it at times. And, and, and then you got to think that in the big picture before we look at these details. All this is on pages 14 and 15 is Congress is checking the power of the presidency, or at least trying to. Because remember that the Constitution is this invitation for struggle between the two branches. And the idea of this struggle between the two branches is voices will be heard, arguments will be brought forward, right? And, and then ideally, as the framers probably wanted, this idea that no one would dominate and therefore you would avoid tyranny, right? It may be slow, it may be ugly, it may be frustrating, but those are probably all better options than tyranny. All right, so uh, a couple things. Congress passes the War Powers Act to check the president's abuse of powers in war. Now, basically, and you guys have heard this before, and you can see the details. Um, Congress, um, the president, if they want to send troops overseas to where hostilities are imminent, without a declaration of war, they have to do these things. They have to tell Congress within 48 hours. They have to withdraw those troops after 60 days, all right? And they must consult Congress if the troops are to engage in combat. Um, does that make sense? And that Congress can pass a resolution not subject to a presidential veto to withdraw troops. Now, they, what that was trying to do is trying to get the president to converse with Congress, to get approval from Congress before inserting troops without congressional approval, or at least without con Congress's um, you know, input on the matter, right? Like, and I would even say, think about, the, well, let's get there in a second. We'll, we'll come back to Syria. All right, but look at the criticisms. Is it unconstitutional? One, right? The president is commander in chief, and if he's using troops, he's using troops, and Congress doesn't have the right to tell them when or how. But they have the power to declare war, right? Okay. Um, it makes the president too inflexible. 
there's a critique, right? That sometimes the president needs to launch a military strike right away without having to worry about or getting, sorry, not worrying about, but getting congressional approval, which can take time. And it may, you know, time might be maybe the matter, all right? Um, or maybe important. All right. Now, uh, the other thing about these war powers is the War Powers Act is, seems to be like it has these rules, but presidents have ignored them, ignored the War Powers Act. All right. Um, the other thing is Congress really just wanted to start a debate in which the president would come to talk to them about war. And therefore, um, like think about Syria recently, right? Like we had these Syrians using chemical weapons in a civil war. We had, the president said, we don't want you to do that, right? Um, and, and the president was thinking about going in and, you know, public approval was low, for, was not for getting involved in Syria. Congress was challenging not to get in Syria for the most part. And the president go, didn't go into Syria, right? Okay. And, and even if you think about the Iraq war, you know, George Bush made an argument, and I know there's, there's controversy around that argument, but let's just assume George Bush went to Congress, made an argument, and asked for permission to go to Congress or, or Iraq, and he got a resolution from Congress saying, yes, you can go, but not a formal declaration of war, right? Okay. The emergency powers. Congress passed the National Emergencies Act of 76. You got to inform Congress in advance if you're going to use your powers in an emergency. The state of emergency ends in six months. The president can declare another six months with congressional review. All right, and that goes all the way back to Rome. Rome used to give a dictator emergency powers for six months uh, to, to solve a crisis, and then they would take that power back or extend it if they desired. All right, now Congress uh, in the CIA. All right. The CIA, you know, works for the, the, the president. It, it works for the American people. But the CIA is our spy agency, right? And they're in international spy agencies. And they had engaged in various abuses uh, in the past without congressional oversight. So what Congress wanted to do is to create more congressional oversight. So look what they do, right? They have investigations in the church committee. All that meant was uh, Congressman Church led a committee hearings on what the CIA was doing. All right. They also added an amendment to leg in, in legislation Right? They created oversight committees, more oversight over the CIA so they wouldn't be able to act without some kind of congressional approval. They also passed the FISA Act, right? which basically said, instead of a president just conducting surveillance about bad guys without congressional approval or without warrants, they would go to the FISA courts and say, it was speed and say, we want to spy on somebody because we think they're up to no good, we think they're a bad guy, give us a warrant. And that's what the FISA courts were for, all right? Um, you know, the other thing is about whether or not torture has been used. You know, there's been congressional um, hearings regarding torture with the last uh, President Bush and, and the um, last Iraq war, right, or the Iraq war. Um, and what I would say, too, now is, you know, any action President Obama takes regarding uh, war powers, he's been called in front of Congress, or at least his, his um, you know, Top 10% of the, the bureaucracy has been called to speak on behalf of him on these issues. All right, hold on one second. All right. Okay. So, all right. Um, now, the other thing is uh, this idea of impoundment, right? Or I mean, like, hold on. Even the NSA today is spying on us right now. Like, that's something we're going to read about in class, right? Like, does the president have that right? You know. Is Congress outraged? Are they not outraged? We saw the president give a speech the other day, right, regarding, look, this is why we're doing it, you know, for national security. We saw him lose the electronic throne. And at the same time, he's saying, but, at this, you know, I still, even though there's national security, we have to protect people's individual rights and liberties, right? Okay. Um, so, and notice that there hasn't been, you know, congressional committees or hearings on that. I think that's interesting. All right. Now, uh, impoundment. Now, remember what impoundment was, right? A president doesn't spend money that's been appropriated by Congress. So there's two kinds. Deferral is temporary impoundment. Rescission is permanent impoundment. So Congress passed BICA, the Budget Impoundment Control Act of 74. And what BICA did, basically, is it tried to limit the president's use of impoundment. So it said um, either house can override referral, which is temporary impoundment, or deferral, sorry, temporary impoundment. Either house can say, no, no, you have to spend the money forcing him to spend the money. If the president says they intend to permanently impound the money, then that is automatically, they cannot, if the president says, I automatically impound the money, they have to wait 
for congressional approval of both houses within 45 days to actually temporarily impound or permanently impound the money. All right. The other thing that BICA did is it established the Congressional Budget Office to check the Office of Management and Budget, the OMB, right? So when the President's OMB brings a budget to Congress and says, here, this is how much money we need for the year, what the um, CBO is doing is doing an analysis of those numbers so members of Congress had their own independent analysis of the budget so they could challenge the President for those budgetary numbers when they do the, the budget each year. All right, more congressional oversight. Just keep thinking, they're trying to give themselves power where they believe that the president had become imperial. All right, and then uh, the other thing is three months to go, they gave three more months for Congress to go over the president's proposed budget, which, you know, is going to be huge. This is a budget for the federal government. They extended three months, so that means the president has to give it three months earlier so they can look through the budget to go over it, all right, giving them time and power. Now, the other thing is they established budget committees in each house standing committees in each house after BICA in which they had the right to go over the budget, all right, hold hearings on the budget. Before it just went to the committees and their little parts of the budget, you know, agriculture committees got agriculture budget, but now there was specific budget committees with power and subcommittees, right, to check the president's budget, right, spending. All right, now, finally, look at this last thing for uh, confirmation of presidential appointees. And all you got to think about is, a presidential appointees in foreign powers, right? The, what they wanted to do, if they're trying to check the president's powers, one of the ways you can check the president's powers, right, is to give more scrutiny to the people in which he's appointing. You know, maybe those people, and all that's doing is making the president recognize Congress, right? And so, you know, remember, senatorial courtesy, right? Before an appointment is made within a state. So, if the president wants to appoint somebody to be a judge at the federal level, which we'll get into a little bit later, all right? Um, they have to go to the senators from that state to get approval. So there's 94, there's 94 district courts, which are federal courts, right? One or more in each state. And so when there's openings on those district courts in Nevada's district court, the president is supposed to talk to our senators about the person they want to nominate and if they approve of them. And if they disapprove of them, technically they're not supposed to appoint that person, all right? Senatorial courtesy, all right? Now, um, the other thing is, there's been a lot more scrutiny on um, presidential appointments by the Senate. They're like, if the president's grown imperial in these powers, we're going to use this power of confirming nominees to challenge a president, right? To assert ourselves. All right. Um, the other thing is this idea of recess appointment. So the notes talk about this guy, John Bolton. So here's a recess, right? Congress is in recess, meaning they're out of session. The Constitution says that if there is a vacancy in the appointment position, during a recess, a president can appoint somebody without Senate approval. So the, the example in your notes is John Bolt from George Bush, right? Uh, but recently, um, we had uh, the head of the National Labor Relations Board, there was an opening, and President Obama had put somebody up for that, that spot, and the Senate had not acted on that spot. And so the president, um, out of frustration, at feeling they weren't going to act, waited for a recess, and then appointed that person to the position, right? Now, there's a time limit how long they can serve because of recess appointment. But that actually made it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is hearing that case regarding whether or not the Senate was truly in recess or not. All right? So that's a way to challenge. Now, the other thing is this idea of rule of fitness. Remember, rule of fitness was simply if you wanted someone to be a judge, you wanted somebody to be the Secretary of State, you wanted someone to be uh, – ten minutes, guys. If you wanted somebody to be um, appointed to position, it was usually the rule of fitness. What that meant is, did you have experience, right? Were you experienced? Were you intelligent? Did you have the, the, the tools to do the job, all right? Now what's happening is, instead of just looking to give a president their top 10%, you know, based on the rule of fitness, what they're looking is, well, how would you rule on this? What is your ideology? What are your politics? What's your background, right? Like, they're looking more than just the rule of fitness, but their policy or ideology, and really giving scrutiny that if they don't like the ideology, they're going after it. This is both D's and R's, all right? Um, which I think that's the world in which you've grown up in, that Supreme Court nominees and presidential appointments, you know, the ideology of those people matter, all right? At least to the Senate as they reassert their power, all right? And then, again, the use of hold is another way to challenge nominees, all right? All right, and then let's get back here. Okay, the legislative veto, all right? So this is going to tweak your brains a little bit, all right? So Congress passes a law. Right? And the president's job is to carry it out. But a step you're going to really learn in the next unit is this. 
Congress passes a law, the relevant federal agency that's in charge of carrying out that law in the executive branch will write something called rules and regulations. Those rules and regulations are essentially how the law is going to be enforced. And there's some power in writing those rules and regulations. Now, sometimes rules and regulations can be written in a way that contradicts the intent of the law, especially if we have divided government, right? So, in the past what happened is Congress could look at those regulations in oversight hearings and go, we don't like that, get rid of it. Boom. Done. However, all right, that was called the legislative veto. When they vetoed rules and regulations, the legislative branch vetoed rules and regulations written by the executive branch, right? Now, that's a violation of separation of powers because once you give a piece of legislation to a president, it's their job to carry it out. If you want it to be carried out a certain way, write a more specific piece of legislation. Right? So you have a case called INS v. Chadda, all right? and in INS v. Chadda, um, basically they said it violates separation of powers, right? and you cannot use the legislative veto of Congress. Think about it. The words legislative veto seem to be repugnant to separation of powers. All right? Okay. Now, finally, there's a few other things that I think you should hear about. Uh, think about this. Um, appropriation powers. Congress always has the power to take away funding if they don't like something, right? Congress can always hold hearings, investigative hearings, right? Congress can always write new legislation, all right? Congress can have bigger uh, criticism, bigger debate. They can use their powers to challenge a president if they desire on foreign affairs. It's just in the past, they generally didn't. But when Schlesinger writes this essay, there are three thinking, should we challenge a president more in foreign affairs because they've grown imperial-like. All right? So, uh, you know, think about, again, Syria. President Obama, you know, heard from everybody challenging him about what to do in Syria. All right? Um, let's see. I think, you know, uh, right now, right, there's uh, criticism of the Patriot Act and the NSA without going to the FISA court first. We're having a debate regarding the NSA. The president gave a speech on the NSA because people have challenged that power. And so, therefore, they're reasserting and trying to check that power, all right, particularly Congress, all right? Uh, all right, that's it, y'all. See you in class.